So at the end of scene two, we saw Romeo and Juliet get married and we talked about how only a few characters know that they got married. So who were those characters? Who knows that they have a relationship that they're married? The nurse, who else? The friar, okay. Yeah, and then obviously Romeo and Juliet. Okay, but that's it, okay. So when this scene starts, you're gonna see um, Mercutio and Benvolio talking. Um, and just keep in mind that they don't know anything about this relationship. Um, so the scene starts just in a public place. So that could just be like a town, you know, part of the town. Um, they're just kind of out in public. Okay. And it just starts with Mercutio. Benvolio, it says page and servants, but they don't have any lines. So. Scene one, a public place. I pray thee, good Mercutio, let's retire. The day is hot, the Capulets abroad, and if we meet, we shall not escape a brawl. For now, these hot days with mad blood stirring. Thou art like one of those fellows that, when he enters the confines of a tavern, claps me his sword upon the table and says, God send me no need of thee, and by the operation of the second cup, draws him on the drawer, when indeed there is no need. Am I like such a fellow? Come, come, thou art as hot a jack in thy mood as any in Italy, and as soon moved to be moody, and as soon moody to be moved. And what two? Nay, and there were two such. We should have none shortly, for one would kill the other. Thou, why thou wilt quarrel with a man that hath a hair more or a hair less in his beard than thou hast. Thou wilt quarrel with a man for cracking nuts, having no other reason, but because thou hast hazel eyes. What eye but such an eye would spy out such a quarrel? Thy head is as full of quarrels as an egg is full of meat, and yet thy head hath been beaten as addle as an egg for quarreling. Thou hast quarreled with a man for coughing in the street, because he hath wakened thy dog that hath lain asleep in the sun. Didst thou not fall out with a tailor for wearing his new doublet before Easter? with another for tying his new shoes with old ribbon, and yet thou wilt tutor me for quarreling? Okay, so we'll stop there. So let's kind of remind ourselves about these characters. Benvolio is what type of person? Gentle, peaceful, okay, um, calm. What kind of person is Mercutio? What are some of his traits that we've seen so far? What purpose does he serve in the play? He's funny, okay. Comical, kind of always in a good mood, joking around, okay. So in the first line of this scene, we see Benvolio being very true to his character. I pray thee, good Mercutio, let's retire. The day is hot, the Capulets abroad, and if we meet, we shall not escape a brawl. For now, these hot days is the mad blood stirring. Okay, um, so I don't know if you guys ever like, sometimes when you're like real hot, it makes you more irritable, right? Um, you'll see like in big cities, the murder rate goes up in the summertime because people are just like on edge and angrier because um, they're just, it's just hot out and it just raises the aggression, okay? So Benvolio is being very true to his character here saying like, we need to go, um, because if we run into the Capulets and we're going to fight and we know that's not good, okay? Um, and then Mercutio in line, I mean, basically throughout, but especially in lines 15 through 27, what's he saying about Benvolio? Like, what is he? Yeah, that he is a fighter, right? He gives all these examples of like, oh, you'll fight with someone over these tiny little things. Like, You'll fight a man that has a hair more or a hair less in his beard than you have. You'll fight a man for cracking nuts because you have hazel eyes, right? Like saying all of these really like trivial things that Benvolio would fight over. That's not true though, of course. So why is Mercutio doing this?
knowing what we know about Mercutio. Yeah, he's just joking around, right? He's just messing around with Benvolio, teasing him, poking fun at him, because we know that Benvolio is not like that whatsoever, okay? So that's your first question on your study guide. What does Mercutio tell us about Benvolio? Is it true? And then explain what's happening there. Okay, so um, at the top of the next page, page 1090, things are gonna kind of start to get complicated. You're gonna really need to pay attention to those stage directions of who's in the scene and who isn't in the scene. Tybalt is going to come in first. What do we know about Tybalt? He's hot-headed. Yeah, he's hot-headed. What did he do in, we heard about something that he does in act two. We don't actually see him do it, but. Okay, he sent a letter to challenge Romeo to fight. Um, so he's going to come into this scene looking for Romeo, okay? Um, Romeo has just recently married Juliet, probably in the last couple of hours, okay? But again, no one in this scene other than Romeo knows that that has happened. So just keep that in mind. And I were so apt to quarrel as thou art, any man should buy the fee simple of my life for an hour and a quarter. The fee simple? By my head, here come the captains. By my heel, I care not. Follow me close, for I can speak to them. Gentlemen, good den, a word with one of you. And but one word with one of us? Couple it with something. Make it a word and a blow. You shall find me apt enough to that, sir, and you will give me occasion. Could you not take some occasion without giving? Mercutio, thou consortest with Romeo. Consort? What dost thou make us minstrels? And thou make minstrels of us. Look to hear nothing but discords. Here's my fiddlestick. Here's that shall make you dance. Zooms consort. We talk here in the public hall of men. Either withdraw unto some private place and reason coldly of your grievances, or else depart. Here all eyes gaze on us. Men's eyes were made to look, and let them gaze. I will not budge for no man's pleasure. I. Okay, so Tybalt comes in and uh, speaks to Mercutio and Tybalt. Mercutio is going to continue to kind of have this joking, kind of teasing tone, you can tell. Um, he's not giving Tybalt like direct answers and Tybalt is angry, right? And so if you've ever been angry and then someone just tries to like joke around with you or mess with you, it kind of makes you more angry, right? And Tybalt is definitely not someone that we want to make more angry because he's already quite angry to begin with. Um, you see in line 40 through 44, if you look at the um, footnote here, Tybalt says, Mercutio, thou consortest with Romeo, which means like you keep company with Romeo. Okay, you're friends with Romeo. Like it says in the footnote, Mercutio pretends to misunderstand him, um, assuming that Tybalt is insulting him by calling Romeo and him a consort, which would be a group of traveling musicians. He then refers to his sword as his fiddlestick, which is a bow, right, for a fiddle if you were a traveling musician. So Mercutio is really just messing with um, Tybalt, he knows very well what Tybalt means. He knows that Tybalt has sent this challenge to Romeo, right? He learned that in Act Two. Um, so he's really just messing with him. Benvolio, as always, trying to be the peacekeeper. We talk here in the public haunt of men, either withdraw unto some private place and reason coldly of your grievances or else depart here, all eyes gaze on us. So why is this a problem? Why does he want them to go somewhere else? 
enemies. Okay, they're enemies. But why should they not talk in public or? Yeah, Levi. Good, right? The prince has issued this ultimatum about fighting in public. So Branvolio is saying like, hey, you guys are gonna fight. Like at least let's go somewhere private <laughs> to do it so that you don't get in trouble with the prince. Okay, of course they're not going to want to hear that. <laughs> Okay, so then you see in your foot, um, sorry, in your stage direction uh, that Romeo enters here, okay? Um, and so then Tybalt is going to go and confront Romeo. Well, peace be with you, sir. Here comes my man. But I'll be hanged, sir, if you wear your livery. If Mary, go before to feel, he'll be your follower. Your worship in that sense may call him man. Romeo, the love I. Bear thee can afford no better term than this. Thou art a villain. Tybalt, the reason that I have to love thee doth much excuse the appertaining rage to such a greeting. Villain am I none. Therefore, farewell. I see thou knowest me not. Boy, this shall not excuse the injuries that thou hast done me. Therefore, turn and draw. I do protest I never injured thee, but love thee better than thou canst devise till thou shalt know the reason of my love. And so, good Capulet, which name I tender as dearly as mine own, be satisfied. Oh, calm, dishonorable, vile submission! How is the comma carried it away? Tibble, you rat catcher, will you walk? What wouldst thou have with me? Good king of cats, nothing but one of your nine lies. That I mean to make bold with all, and as you shall use me hereafter, try beat the rest of the eight. Will you pluck your sword out of his pilcher by the ears? Make haste, lest mine be about your ears, ere it be out. I am for you. Okay, so Tybalt tells Romeo that he's a villain. Okay, um, so he confronts him. Romeo is going to try to diffuse the situation, right? He says, um, the reason I have to love thee doth much excuse the appertaining rage to such a greeting. Villain am I none, therefore farewell. I see thou knowest me not. Okay. Um, and then Tybalt is still angry. Then Romeo says, I do protest I never injured thee, but love thee better than thou canst devise. Till thou shalt know the reason of my love and so good Capulet, which name I tender as dearly as my own, be satisfied. So we know that Romeo genuinely means these things, right? That he's like, I hold your name as dearly as my own. We know that that's true because he just married Juliet. But Tybalt doesn't know that. And Tybalt probably thinks that Romeo is being like very like mocking and sarcastic about his family name by saying like, oh, I love your name as much as my own. When Tybalt would have no reason to think that Romeo is being honest about that, okay? So, Romeo really does not want to fight Tybalt at all, okay? What would be his reasons for not wanting to fight Tybalt? This is on your study guide number two. There's two main reasons. Why would he not want to fight Tybalt? Mm -hmm. He just married Juliet probably mere hours ago, and that's her cousin. Why else would Romeo probably not really want to fight? He doesn't want to die. Yeah. yeah, the prince has issued this ultimatum, right? That if you fight in the streets, you'll die. Okay, Romeo certainly has something to live for now because he is in love with this woman or this, not really a woman, she's a girl, <laughs> but um, he has something to live for, right? He definitely doesn't want to get in trouble with the prince and then have to be killed for fighting, okay? But Mercutio also doesn't know about this um, situation with Juliet. So Mercutio is going to assume here in line 68, where he says, oh, calm, dishonorable, vile submission. He thinks Romeo is afraid to fight, okay? Tybalt is a pretty capable swordsman. Um, so Mercutio is going to assume that Romeo is afraid to fight and is going to kind of step in to defend his friend. Okay, so that's why he says, uh, Tybalt, you rat catcher, will you walk? Which basically means, will you fight? 
Okay, and then Tybalt says, I am for you in line 77. Okay, so now you're going to have Mercutio and Tybalt with their swords drawn, okay? Because Mercutio thinks that Romeo is afraid um, and that Tybalt's been insulting him. He's trying to defend his friend. Um, okay, this next section's a little hard to visualize. We'll talk about it after we listen to it. Gentle Mercutio, put thy rapier up. Come, sir, your Cassano. Draw them, bully, or bring down their weapons. And gentlemen, for shame, forbear this outrage. Tybalt Mercutio, the prince expressly hath forbid this bed meeting in Verona streets. Come, Tybalt, kill Mercutio. I am hurt. Plague of both your houses. I am sped. Is he gone and hath nothing? What? Art thou hurt? I, I a scratch. A scratch. Mary, tis not. Where's my page? Go, villain, fetch a surgeon. Courage, man. The hurt cannot be much. No, tis not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church door, but tis enough. Will serve. Ask for me tomorrow, and you shall find me a brave man. I am ever thy warrant for this world. The plague of both your houses. Zoons, a dog, a rat, a mouse, a cat. To scratch a man to death, a braggart, a rogue, a villain that fights by the book of arithmetic. Why the devil came you between us? I was hurt under your arm. I thought all for the best. Help me into some house, Benvolio, or I shall faint. A plague of both your houses. They have made worms meet of me. I have it, and soundly too. Your houses. Okay, so we'll stop there. Okay, so this fight on page 1091, obviously it's, you just hear like a couple swords clanking in the audio, but in like a stage production and particularly in the movie, it is much more drawn out that they're fighting. Um, so Romeo is trying to break up the fight, okay? So you've got Mercutio and Tybalt, and you know, you you saw in like the first scene in the movie, right? the sword fighting, um, Romeo gets in between them to try to stop them from fighting, which keeps Mercutio from really being able to see what's happening to be able to like defend himself. And so Tybalt stabs him, like basically like underneath Romeo's arm, okay? So he like kind of like poke, you know, sticks around and jabs him, okay? Um, so in line, like right above line 85, where it says Tybalt, under Romeo's arms, thrusts Mercutio in and flies with his men. So basically like, you know, Romeo's like has his arms up trying to stop them from fighting and Tybalt stabs Mercutio under Romeo's arm, okay? And then, Merc uh, and then Tybalt runs with his men, okay? So Mercutio has been stabbed. He says, I am hurt, a plague on both your houses. I am sped, is he gone and hath nothing? Um, so a plague on both your houses, he repeats this frequently, okay? Um, he's basically like, remember, he's not related to either of them. So he's basically saying that like, he's cursing both of their houses because there's no, like there was no need for him to even be involved in this, right? Like, and their, their fighting is what's leading to him being injured. Um, so your study guide asks about this line 92 and 93, ask for me tomorrow and you shall find me a grave man. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. What figure of speech are we using here? Good, this is a pun. Okay, because grave can have two separate meanings. What's one meaning that grave can have? You're using grave as a noun. What does it mean? Yeah, where you're buried, right? Like, um, burial plot, right? Like a little space where you're buried. If you're using grave as an adjective, what does it mean? Like if you say you're in grave danger, what kind of danger are you in? Mm 
Any ideas? Yeah, then. Okay, fatal, um, serious, right? Like, um, yeah, like um, extreme or serious fatal danger, right? In this case, I would say it means like more like a serious, like if you're a, if you describe someone's personality as grave, it means that they're very like, I don't know, almost melancholy and like not, um, like almost monotone, right? They're just kind of like gray and dull. Okay, um, I'll just call it serious for now. Okay, so Mercutio is always laughing, silly, funny, joking. Okay, so when he says, ask for me tomorrow and you shall find me a grave man, he means like, you'll find me a serious man. But he also means like, I will be dead, right? Like I will be in a grave. So this is a pun. Um, and when you talk about what its meaning is, like basically he is usually happy, but he will be serious. He will also be in a grave. Uh, it has that double meaning and it's very typical of Mercutio to like still be joking even as he's dying, right? Okay, so Benvolio kind of like pulls him out like into a house to, um, I mean, for, for play directing reasons, it's so that he doesn't have to like die on stage and then be like laying there trying to not breathe on stage. Um, but he says that it's to, um, because he'll faint. Help me into some house Benvolio or I shall faint. Um, okay. So we're on line 102 on page 1092. Um, notice in the middle of the page that Tybalt is going to re-enter the scene. So he has run away and he's going to come back. This gentleman, the prince's near ally, my very friend, has got this mortal hurt in my behalf. My reputation stained with Tybalt's slander. Tybalt, that an hour hath been my kinsman. Oh, sweet Julian, thy beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper softened valor and steel. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, brave Mercutio's dead. That gallant spirit hath aspired the clouds, which too untimely here did scorn the earth. This day's black fate on Mo days doth depend. This but begins the woe others must end. Here comes the furious Tybalt back again. Alive in triumph and Mercutio slain, away to heaven respect of lenity, and fire I fear be my conduct now. Now, Tybalt, take the villain back again that late thou gavest me. For Mercutio's soul is but a little way above our heads, staying for thine to keep him company. Either thou or I, or both, must go with him. Thou, wretched boy, that didst consort him here, shall twit him hence. This shall determine that. Um, okay, so um, Romeo up in line 102 is talking about how um, basically like his love for Juliet has made him like less manly and less brave because he should have just fought Sybil to start with um, because Mercutio died protecting his reputation. Um, and then Benvolio re-enters, explains that Mercutio is dead. Um, we've got some alliteration in line one twelve. This day's black fate on Mo days doth depend. Those D's. Um, and then Tybalt comes back, and Romeo is not happy. Right? 
he's like, Tybalt's alive and Mercutio's dead. Like, this is not okay. Um, he says, now Tybalt, take the villain back again that late thou gavest me for Mercutio's soul is but a little way above our heads, staying for thine to keep him company. So he's like, Mercutio's soul is just waiting for you to be dead with him. He says, either thou or I or both must go with him. So he's saying either you're going to die or I'm going to die or we're both going to die. But um, he's clearly going to fight him to the death here. Okay. Um, so this is pretty different from where we were in question two, where Romeo doesn't want to fight Tybalt. How can we kind of explain this? dramatic shift from not wanting to fight to now being willing to fight. He killed, he killed his friend. Okay. Now, logically, if you were a logical person, you could think, okay, yes, he killed my friend, but, you know, the prince, like, he will be dealt with for doing that. I still just married Juliet. I still don't want to get killed for killing some or for fighting in the street. So I still shouldn't fight. But is Romeo a logical person? Definitely not. Okay. Romeo is over emotional. Romeo acts before he thinks about the consequences, right? He's kind of reckless. He just like lets his emotions rule him. And that's definitely what happens here. Okay. So he's overcome with his emotions. He fights Tybalt. You see in the stage direction. And here in the excellent acting on the audio, they fight and Tybalt falls. So Romeo kills Tybalt, okay? All right, then Benvolio is going to tell Romeo that he needs to run away because um, he says the citizens are up, that's like the police, okay? Um, and then um, on the next page, you will see like, the Capulets and the Montagues and the Prince, they're all gonna, they've all sort of been called to this huge brawl. So they will all come in together. Oh. Romeo, away, be gone. The citizens are up and Tybalt slain. Stand not amazed. The Prince will doom thee death if thou art taken. Hence, be gone, away. Oh, I am fortune's fool, why dost thou stay? Which way ran he that killed Mercutio? Tybalt, that murderer. Which way ran he? There lies that Tybalt. Oh, sir, go with me. I charge thee in the prince's name, obey. Where are the vile beginners of this fray? Oh, noble prince, I can discover all the unlucky manage of this fatal brawl. There lies the man slain by young Romeo that slew thy kinsman, brave Mercutio. Tybalt, my cousin, oh, my brother's child, oh, Prince, oh cousin, oh husband, oh the blood is spilled of my dear kinsman. Prince, as thou art true, for blood of ours shed blood of Montague. Oh cousin, cousin. Okay, so basically the prince is asking like, who started this fight? Benvolio says, I can discover all, which means he's like, I can tell you what happened. Okay, he says, there lies the man slain by young Romeo, that slew thy kinsman, brave Mercutio. So he's saying, there's Tybalt, Romeo killed him. Tybalt killed your kinsman, Mercutio. So Mercutio is related to the prince, probably like cousin, second cousin, who knows, right? They're somehow related. Um, <clears throat> and then the prince is gonna ask about who began this bloody fray and Benvolio in this, uh, basically the rest of this page is just kind of recapping everything that happened. Okay, so like how Tybalt came in, how Romeo didn't want to fight him, right? He's going to review basically everything that's just happened. Benvolio, who began this bloody fray? Tybalt, here slain, whom Romeo's hand did slay. Romeo, that spoke him fair, bid him bethink how nice the quarrel was, and urged with all your high displeasure. All this uttered with gentle breath, calm look, knees humbly bowed. Could not take truce with the unruly spleen of Tybalt, death to peace, but that he tilts with piercing steel at bold Mercutio's breast, who, all as hot, 
turns deadly point to point, and with a martial scorn, with one hand beats cold death aside, and with the other sends it back to Tybalt, whose dexterity retorts it. Romeo, he cries aloud, hold friends, friends, part, and swifter than his tongue, his agile arm beats down their fatal points, and twits them rushes, underneath whose arm an envious thrust from Tybalt hit the life of stout Mercutio, and then Tybalt fled, but by and by comes back to Romeo, who had but newly entertained revenge, and to it they go like lightning, for ere I could draw to part them was stout Tybalt slain, and as he fell did Romeo turn and fly. This is the truth, or let Ben Bolio die. Okay, <clears throat> so your question four on your study guide is to summarize the order of events in the fight between Romeo, Tybalt, and Mercutio. Personally, I would recommend like abbreviating, okay, so you can put like T for Tybalt, M for Mercutio, R for Romeo, otherwise you're going to run out of room. So what's the first thing that um, happens in this order of events? Yeah. Good. Okay, so I would personally like number them, but it's up to you. Tybalt challenges Romeo. What happens next? Remember, we're summarizing, so it doesn't have to be every single detail. Tybalt challenges Romeo. Do Tybalt and Romeo fight now? No, who fights? Mercutio fights Tybalt. Okay, it's a summary. You don't have to explain all of the reasoning behind why. Okay. Then what? Okay. Um, I would probably put like Romeo tries to stop fight and then Mercutio dies. It is important that Romeo kind of got in between. Then what happens? What happens next? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Okay. So you just want to kind of have that in your mind of the order. And it's also on your study guide. Okay, so uh, Lady Capulet and Lord Montague are both going to kind of try to plead their case here to the prince. Lady Capulet is going to say that Monte, uh, that Romeo should definitely be put to death. Um, Lady Capulet says that Romeo should definitely be put to death. And Montague is going to try to argue the other side, right? He obviously wants to save the life of his son. He is a kinsman to the Montague. Affection makes him false. He speaks not true. Some 20 of them fought in this black strife, and all those 20 could but kill one life. I beg for justice, which thou, Prince, must give. Romeo slew Tybalt. Romeo must not live. Romeo slew him. He slew Mercutio. Who now the price of his dear blood doth owe? Not Romeo, Prince. He was Mercutio's friend. His fault concludes but what the law should end. The life of Tilt. And for that offense, immediately we do exile and hence. I have an interest in your hate's proceeding. My blood to your rude brawls doth lie of bleeding. But I'll immerse you with so strong a fine that you shall all repent the loss of mine. I will be deaf to pleading of excuses. Nor tears nor prayers shall purchase our abuses. Therefore use none, that roam your hands in haste. Else, when he is found, that power is his last. Bear hence this body, and attend our will. Mercy but murders, pardoning those that kill. Okay, so what does the prince decide to do to Romeo? He banishes him, okay? He says, um, well, Lord Montague argues, right? Um, his fault concludes, but what the law should end, the life of Tybalt. So basically, 
Montague's argument is that Tybalt and Mercutio were the ones who were fighting. And Tybalt killed Mercutio. So Tybalt is the guilty party here at this point. Tybalt should be killed for fighting in Verona's streets. But Romeo killed Tybalt. So he's saying that basically Romeo just did what the prince would have done anyway. Right? So he's saying like he shouldn't die because he was basically just fulfilling what you would have done anyway, the sentence that you would have given anyway. And then the prince says, and for that offense, immediately we do exile him hence. Okay, he talks about how his relative has died as a result of their um, brawl and their feud, right? My blood for your rude brawls doth lie a bleeding. Um, and then he says, like, I'm going to find you so strongly that you'll all repent this loss um, of my kinsmen. I'll be deaf to ple pleading and excuses nor tears, nor prayers shall purchase out abuses, therefore use none. So he's basically like, no matter how much you beg or plead, I'm not changing my mind, this is what it is. Um, so he says, let Romeo hence in haste, else when he is found, that hour is his last. So he's saying, I'm exiling him, but if I find him in Verona, that's it, okay? This is his like, basically his only chance to survive is that he has to get out of Verona, okay? So question five on your study guide is to explain his judgment and why he makes that ruling. So essentially what we just said, he banishes Romeo and it's because Romeo basically did what the law would have done, but he also can't just like let Romeo kill a guy and not do anything about it. So he has to give him some punishment. Okay, so you'll need to also write your summary for scene one. Um, and then you guys are gonna read scenes two through five on your own. The audio starts at 1041. Um, so if you want to use the audio, it's linked in Canvas um, and you can just fast forward it to 1041. Uh, scene two is Juliet basically waiting for night to come so that Romeo can come climb up into her bedroom on the rope ladder, um, but instead she learns of Tybalt's death. Um, and of course, Blanky very upset. Um, scene three takes place in Friar Lawrence's cell with Romeo and Friar Lawrence. Um, scene four takes place back at the Capulet house and then scene five uh, takes place in the Capulet's orchard slash Juliet's bedroom kind of. It, I mean, they're at the window, I guess, so, okay. So this uh, rest of this act basically takes you through like the rest of this day. Um, so we had um, act one took place on one day, act two um, sort of like that night and then into that very early morning. And now act three is the rest of that day. Okay, so we're still, these, these two people have still only known each other about 24 hours, so. All right. Um, any questions on scene one? Okay, so if you have questions that come up, just let me know and I can help, of course. Um, if you want to use the audio, it is linked in your Canvas announcement for today. If you'd rather just read on your own, that's fine too. Um, 